I was thinking about the issue of discrimination in relationship to sex because I've been thinking a lot about discrimination lately because everybody thinks discrimination is a bad idea which is a very stupid proposition because you're discriminating all the time and the most fundamental form of discrimination is choice of sexual partner and so you might say, well why should that even be allowed? because it is the most fundamental form of discrimination so for example, almost everyone is racially prejudiced when it comes to sexual partners so you think, well is that right? Is that a, what about, uh, are you do you use age as an exclusionary criteria? Probably. Do you use physical attractiveness? Only insofar as you're able, right? You use it completely if you could get away with it, roughly speaking, but you can't because the most attractive people aren't going to be anywhere near you. So you can't do it, but you'd like to. Health, yes. Strength, yes. Wealth, yes. Education, definitely. So you, it's unbelievably discriminatory. And so you might say, well, why is that? Justifiable, and it seems to me that it's something like, well, you get to say no to me if I get to say no to you. It's something like that. We've agreed that everybody gets to discriminate on that basis, and because everybody can do it, then it's fair. It's something like that. But it's very much worth thinking about. You know, I don't know if you know this, but in Huxley's book, Brave New World, where the family had been completely demolished, right, and children were conceived in bottles and given and produced in factories so the whole idea of the relationship between sex and procreation had become a taboo one of the uh, mantras the slogans of the society was everyone belongs to everyone else and so it was actually a social faux pas to refuse to sleep with someone just as it was a social faux pas to have any exclusionary relationship because another thing that you might notice is that there's nothing more discriminatory than falling in love with someone. It's like, you're special, and all the rest of you? <laughs> no. So it's the ultimate exclusionary act, right? And yet we presume that that's an acceptable, not only acceptable, we demand that as a, as a right. And, well, that's worth thinking about a lot. So it's more or less a truism that if you take a male dominance hierarchy, the probability that the men at the top of the hierarchy will leave offspring is much higher than the probability that the men at the bottom will leave offspring. And it's true in many, many species. Now, there's a much higher probability of the average female leaving offspring than the average man. So, so now then imagine that there's characteristics that push a man up a dominance hierarchy. Okay, and then imagine that there are characteristics that push a man up a set of dominance hierarchies. So that each dominance hierarchy has something in common with all of the others. It's sort of like the idea of a, of a good player of a game being a good sport across games. So then imagine that the idea of the successful male starts to become encapsulated in, in, in biology. Because the species is going to, the male part of the species at least, is going to be adapting to the selection pressures placed on the male by the male dominance hierarchy. So what happens is you have a competition between men. The men that win the competition find partners and mate. So the, the, the male is going to start to adapt to the fact of the selection that's implemented by the dominance hierarchy. Then you can imagine that that's going to take, case, take place across dominance hierarchies because this is happening in many, many situations spread across time. And so then the idea of how the proper man should act starts to become incorporated in the biology and also in the expectations of the society. And then that starts to loop. So as the expectations become clearer and clearer, the notion of what it constitutes success becomes clearer and clearer as well. And the two things get tangled together. Now, and I, th I think you can see that a manifestation of that whenever you go watch a movie. Because you immediately identify the hero and you identify with him. It's like, he's the person that your mythological imagination grasps onto and you play that out using your body as a representational platform when you watch the movie. And so maybe you admire the hero. If he's a successful hero, you do. Well, that admiration is the manifestation of the instinct that drives you towards that kind of behavior. And not only can you manifest it, in which case you're likely to feel good about yourself, because you know that sometimes you can feel good about yourself and sometimes not, 
but you're also going to be able to recognize it when you see it in the world. And that's going to manifest itself in admiration. And admiration is the proclivity to imitate. So the meme can be so, so the, you can imagine dominance hierarchies are very, very old. They're like 300 million years old. They've been around a very long time. And the idea that we have an image of what it takes to climb the dominance hierarchy, it's, it's more or less self-evident. Because that's the landscape that selected us. And at the same time, you know, the, the archetype, the pattern that propagates you up the dominance hierarchy is also the same pattern that makes you attractive to women. They're the same thing. So, and of course, that's a massively powerful selection mechanism. And sexual selection has really shaped human beings. It's turned us into what we are. And that's an interesting thing too, because you know, this is one of the things that really bothers me about the emphasis of evolutionary scientists on randomness. It's like the, the gener mutation generation process is random or quasi-random. We don't know that for sure, because there is evidence now that you can inherit acquired characteristics. And that was, nobody thought that was possible 20 years ago. So things are, have taken a very weird twist in the Darwinian world. But for the sake of argument, we could say that the mutation process is random. But the selection process isn't random. It's not even close to random. Ever since creatures have been able to evaluate one another, the selection process hasn't been random. And so basically we're selected by, you could say, by the manifestation of mind in the world. Unless you believe that women, for example, exercise no conscious choice in their mate selection, which seems completely absurd. First of all, men consciously choose who's going to lead them, at least in part. You know, who's going to succeed in a hierarchy. And women consciously choose their sexual partners. So the idea that the selection process, that the evolutionary process is random is... It's an absurd proposition. Sexual selection makes it non-random. And Darwin knew that. He emphasized sexual selection a lot, but mo modern biologists since the time of Darwin, except for the last about 20 years, downplayed the role of sexual selection. And I think the reason for that is that it, it brings mind into the evolutionary process in a way that they don't like. And no wonder, it's complicated, you know, it's, it's like, to some degree, we're consciously directing our own evolution, at least through the mechanism of selection. Well, you dream of the future, and then you try to make it into a reality. That seems to be an important thing. You know, or maybe you dream up a nightmare and try to make that into a reality, because people do that too, if they're hell-bent on revenge, for example, and full of hatred and resentment. I mean, that manifests itself in terrible fantasies. You know, those are dreams, then people go act them out.